This is the 11th lecture in my Ethnomathematics series, uh, this, and the third lecture uh, in the section on games and puzzles. And what we're going to be looking at today are game charts and a couple of classes of games, the maximal blockade games, and uh, starting some work on the three in a row games. Uh, we were talking about Pong Hao Ki and the basic chart for that. So here is the game chart, if we completed it, uh, for Pong Hao Ki. And in uh, some sense, this plays on feels a little bit when you have one of these game charts as if it were a game itself. So we start here, and if player A goes first, they have no choice except to move here. B has no choice except to go here. A has no choice except to go here. Now finally, B has a couple of choices. They can either go that way or this way. And so it sort of feels like we're just kind of moving pieces around on this board instead of uh, the game board. But things are really quite different here when we're sort of wandering around on this uh, game chart. Uh, one thing is that we only really have one piece. We don't have several pieces that are sort of trying to uh, track the other ones and stuff. We're just moving around that one piece that goes to whatever position we're in. And of course, we can only move on certain edges. So player A moves along player A edges, and player B can move along player B edges. Uh, and this sort of chart, though, does give us the ability uh, to understand a lot more uh, about the game. Uh, for example, uh, winning spots are certainly easier to see. So notice that this is an A, a win for A. Um, a has ways to get to that, but once we get to this position, B has no moves to get out of there. So we're stuck, and B obviously has no, uh, no options, no moves, and A has one. In a similar sense here, if B were to get over to this position, A has no moves from there. But every other position, it's easily seen that uh, A and B both have moves uh, from that particular position. And uh, many other kinds of analysis are easier to see as well. And we'll sort of take a look at how we use these game charts uh, to analyze some games. Okay? So uh, there are a variety of properties that these game charts allow us to see, at least reasonably easy. So one is, uh, can the game be won at all? And, of course, we should be able to see that by having those circled states. We can identify where those are supposed to be by the positions that have one kind of edge coming in, but, but not the other. Um, is it possible to force a win? Uh, we hope not, because otherwise that would mean that the game is somehow tilted in one person's favor. But we'll be able to see that sort of thing pretty easily on the game charts, as we'll see. Uh, another thing that we'll be spending a reasonable amount of time looking at is how far ahead do we have to look uh, if we want to be able to win the game or at least prevent ourselves from losing the game? How, how far ahead do we have to look? And that's, we'll, that will involve taking a look at which of the moves that we have on that game chart that go to those win states. And once we get to places where we have moves that are going towards the win states and the other player doesn't have ways to get off of the path that leads there, then that means we have some sort of a a uh, force wind from some particular position. Okay? There's also a concept of traps. In a lot of uh, games, we'll see there, with best play, uh, the game would go on forever. And in fact, most games are sort of like that. With the best play, the whole game should be a draw, it should be evenly matched, we would just keep going forever. Uh, but there's often these sort of trap positions. So what we mean by a trap is some kind of a position where we have a couple of different moves for our, that our opponent could make. And if they make the bad move from that position, then we'll be able to win the game. Of course, if they make the good move, then we'll just keep playing uh, uh, possibly forever. Okay. And something else we'll be able to see a lot of times in these uh, game charts is uh, certain issues about whether the game is fair. Do both players have an equal chance to win? Uh, do they need an equal look ahead? Most of the times for the games that we will be looking at, those will be reasonably uh, obvious because there will be a symmetry between the positions for one player and those for another. So let's continue with analyzing this, uh, this game. So here's our, our chart. and Let's take a look at some of those issues that I just uh, said uh, that we would be able to see. One is, is it winnable? And certainly there are ways of you know, going from here and going A, B, A, B, A, B, and B would win. Just the existence of those circled states pretty much tells us that it will be winnable. Uh, can we force a win? Um, and uh, this is sort of interesting here, um, how we can see this. Uh, the, the basic idea is 
that, for example, for A to win, we have to get down to this position. How could we have gotten here? Well, of course, we could have gotten here by A moving from here, but that means that B would have to have moved to this position. Well, B is not going to move there if they've just won. What about here? Well, if B uh, is in this position, they could have made this move to win. Otherwise, they could have gone over, they might have made the mistake, the bad move, and gone over here, in which case A would win. But certainly that isn't forced. So that uh, if we got to this position, B, if he was a reasonable player, would just win. The other way we can get to this position for A to win is if B made this move, and then A could get into the winning state. But this position here has two different moves that B could make. And so we're not going to ever be forced to have B have to make this move. We could just go up there and keep wandering around to the rest of uh, the board. So, uh, no, there's not going to be any way for uh, A to be able to force a win, and symmetrically there's not going to be any way for B to win it. Then the question that comes right after that is how far ahead do we have to be able to see so that we don't lose? And so I'm drawing this line right here. Uh, these lines that we'll be drawing in some of these game charts indicate the idea that when you cross over the line, basically the game is at an end. And if you stay on, the, on one side of the line, up here there are no winning positions. We can just wander around there forever. Nobody's going to win the game. But basically, as soon as we cross over this line, if A were to cross over this line here, then B would be able to win, unless they were a particularly poor player, and go over here or something. And similarly, if B were to cross this line, then A would be able to win. So this is a very important line, and we'll see that sort of line coming up in a variety of forms in some of the other games uh, as well. But how far ahead do we have to see not to lose? Well, A wants to make sure that they don't make this move, that instead they go up here to places where we won't be losing. So we have to be able to see ahead one, two, ply. So from here, if all I could see was one ply ahead, I would say, no, that's not a win, that's not a win. I might just pick those moves randomly, and then if I accidentally made this move, then B would immediately win. But if I can see two ply ahead, I will realize that if I make that move, then B will be able to make this move and win the game. So the answer to this is two ply look ahead. If we have two ply look ahead, um, then we will not be able to lose uh, the game. Unless, of course, we just sort of you know, lose track of what we're up to. Well, what about setting traps? Uh, uh, we would like, we hope, even if the other person normally has a uh, two-ply look ahead, if we can sort of play rapidly, they'll forget to analyze things really carefully. So this trap position is a position like this, where if B makes the correct move, they will move up and get into places where there's no dangers, there's no winning positions. But if they make the incorrect move, then they will come down here and we'll be able to, to, to win the game. And again, you know, if they're, even if they have two-ply look ahead, if we can get them playing fast enough or they're not thinking about it or we play long enough that they get a little tired and make mistakes, then the more times we can get to this position right here, that track position, the more likely it is that one time, just by accident, they will make the incorrect move and come down here where we can win. So, to the look ahead to set those traps, we need to see, ah, that is a trap, and either we need to be able to see three moves ahead, I can see this position, one move, two moves, and three moves. So if I can see three moves ahead, three ply ahead, I should say, uh, then I'll be able to see to make that move. Otherwise, of course, I can just sort of memorize this particular thing. I can memorize a position here. There are lots of situations in which I'll be talking about two-ply or three-ply here, um, three-ply to, to set those traps. And this is a simplification because it may be that there are other ways of remembering what are the dangerous positions, what are the uh, positions where we might be able to set a trap. But nevertheless, this discussion about two-ply, three-ply, that sort of thing, is a good way of comparing games across, uh, 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 across a couple of different cultures, across a couple of different kinds of games, um, even if the way that a good player will win them might be more by memorizing some kind of a feature of these positions. Okay? So there is our trap position, and we can, if we see three ply ahead, if we can see three ply ahead on a regular basis, and our opponent sees two ply ahead, but at least occasionally makes mistakes, 
then we would be able to see that, and every once in a while they'll make that mistake, and we will win the game. Okay. Again, this is something that we have to be able to see or know in some way that we should try that position, because we do have another alternative here. We could make the move up there, which just then takes us into draw territory once again. And uh, finally, is this a fair game? It certainly seems to be fair. There's, for example, in this starting position here, um, we don't actually start here, although it sort of feels like it's a little closer to an A winning position. We would, the, it always start, it has to start with A, then B, then A, and now we're essentially equidistant from both of the winds. Everything is nice and symmetric, so there doesn't seem to be any particular advantage to one player over the other. So it's apparently fair. I want to take a look at a one-ply uh, look ahead and how would this game change if we had one-ply look ahead. Well, what would that mean? One-ply look ahead means that you can see the effect of making one move. So if I went from here and I was A, I could see what the board would look like after I made that position. It's not a winning position, I would recognize that. But here, for example, if I'm in this position with one-ply look ahead, I recognize that this move will take me into a winning position, and I recognize that this move will not take me to a winning position. So if I have one ply look ahead, what that means then is that this move will not be made. Okay? Um, I, if I'm in this position, I'm going to make, and I'm A, I will make that move. I will not make this move. If I did get to this position, uh, which is hard, but if I get to this position, I will not make that move to A either. I will make this move down and win the game. This move is never going to get made if, uh, if A has one ply look ahead, and similarly, this move will never be made if B has one ply look ahead. So if we're assuming one ply look ahead on the part of these two players, the board sort of simplifies to this. Well, it simplifies even a bit further because this position is now a position that nobody can ever get to. This, this is an unreachable position, we call it. Uh, if B makes this move, B is one. He certainly has no reason to make another move and then go over here and give A the opportunity to win. In fact, it would be, again, a violation of the rules. B's not allowed to make two moves in a row. So these moves will never be made, and this position can never be reached. Consequently, when we go to the one-ply look-ahead chart, we now have a substantially simplified board here. That's one of the things uh, that happens fairly regularly with these game charts. When we go into things like one-ply look-ahead or two-ply look-ahead, a lot of moves that we might think are playable are ones that a better player is going to realize are bad and not make those moves. So if we look at this chart now, um, the analysis of the exact sorts of things we were looking at before becomes noticeably easier. So, for example, can we force a win? The only way for B to win is to get down in this chain. And, of course, when I'm at this position, A had two different options. Could either go up or could go down. So, certainly, we cannot force them to win. A always does have an alternative that will not go towards that winning state. Um, and uh, so, we, that's not possible. How far do we have to look ahead not to lose? Well, again, this whole area is sort of simplified. So when we're looking at this position here, A needs to be able to see two ply ahead to know not to make that move, but to make this one instead. So of course we come up with the same answer, it's just a little bit easier to see it. Uh, how far ahead do we have to look to set traps? Again, uh, we know that this is the dangerous position. This is the one where A could make a bad move, so B would like to set the trap by going to that position. And that's the three ply look ahead. Okay. And uh, because the game, the, the game board is somewhat simplified, maybe it's a little clearer that this does seem to be a fair game. Now let's look a little further. What happens with a two-ply look-ahead? Well, if we assume that both players have two-ply look-ahead, then from this position, A will never make this move because they'll realize with two-ply that making that move allows B to win. So they will always make this move. And similarly, if B also has two-ply look ahead, this move will never be made. Those positions are never in there. And so the two-ply look ahead chart looks like this. Those bottom pieces are now completely cut off. And of course, in this game, there are no winning positions. None of those positions are circled. And so that necessarily means that this game is always a draw. Which is to say that if we're playing a game between two people, 
both of whom have two-ply look-ahead and do not make mistakes, uh, then the game will always be a draw. Remember, this position is, uh, gives A the opportunity to make a mistake and make the missing move here. This position is a trap for B, allowing them to, to make a mistake on their two-ply look-ahead and make the move that we don't show going down there. Okay? So this kind of a chart, these look-ahead charts, both the one-ply and the two-ply look-ahead chart, do a dramatic uh, amount of simplification of the game chart uh, and allow us to, to understand a little bit more about the overall complexity of the game. So uh, let's look at some of the other blockade games, the other maximal blockade games. Um, uh, Marsha Asher does a, a very important eight-sided game from New Zealand, which we'll do in a little bit. Uh, the Pong Hao Ki, of course, was sort of a four-sided game. Uh, she says that the four-sided and six-sided games uh, are not really good games. The four-sided game is impossible to win. The six-sided game, she says, uh, it's not that it's impossible, but it's a very, it, to her, it's a very simple game. But that's because she's only considering squares and hexagons without that deleted edge. Pong Hao Ki was played on a square, but had one edge erased, and that made quite a difference in the game. If that square was there, there would be no winning positions. Okay? So now we're going to take a look at the same game played on a hexagon, again with one edge erased. Uh, turns out that this game was invented by the advertising people at General Mills in Minneapolis, and they used this on the back of a Berry Berry Kicks cereal box. So the game itself uh, is almost the same as Pong Hao Ki, um, but, uh, as I say, is based on a hexagon. And we talked to them, uh, the, the advertising people there that had invented this game, They'd never heard of this game, and so we know this to be an independent invention. So here's the game board from the back of Berry Berry Kicks, and I hope you see, here's our hexagon around here. There's lots of extra little pictures in here to make the game uh, uh, slightly more interesting for children. And we have our hexagon, there's the center, there's the six sides, here's the missing edge. Uh, and in the, their game, which they call Berry Patch Scramble, now we have these six pieces here. Three strawberries, three uh, uh, raspberries, or blueberry raspberries they must be three red and three blue, and we place them around the board alternating, and then we try and play. Uh, and you can see, if you read these rules, place your berry pieces uh, as shown, take turns moving down the paths to an empty space. You win when the other player can no longer move a piece. Jumping pieces is not allowed. So this is exactly the same game as what we had with Pong Hao Ki. Okay? So uh, the missing edge, there's a, a, a visual difference in Pong Hao Ki, the missing edge was at the top, and here it's at the bottom. Both of them have the center opening at the very beginning, so the start state in both cases has an open spot in the center. There's a slight uh, difference in terms of the starting position. Uh, Barry here alternates the pieces, um, red, blue, red, blue, all the way around. Pong Hao uh, and Pong Hao Ki doesn't have them alternating. It starts with uh, one color on top and one color on the bottom. But if we had followed through that game chart, those first three moves get us to this position, always force us after the third move to be in this sort of alternating colors around the center position very, very quickly. Um, other than that, they are exactly the same rules. Okay? So uh, the berry patch game. This was invented in Korea. The, uh, I'm sorry, the Pong Hao Ki, or a version like that, was played in Korea, China, India, and Thailand, uh, and also invented in essentially the same form here, except on a slightly larger polygon in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, as we say, we know that this is really an example of independent invention, uh, because there's, you know, while some of these other ones, we're pretty sure that the Kore Korean and Chinese game uh, are essentially the same, that one of them, you know, influenced the other one. We're not sure from India and Thailand whether the, their, their heritage descends from, their, from, from those countries, but they're close enough that it could have been, but it might have been independent invention in those two countries. But this one in Minneapolis, we certainly know, is an example of that independent invention. And so it seems to be an example that the games that we enjoy as people uh, to to some extent, are a shared human characteristic. When we see these sorts of games, and this is not the only one, there are lots of other kinds of, of games that are shared across widely diverse cultures that we have no reason to believe there was any uh, contact between them. But this is an example of some games that are impressively close 
in terms of their rule structures and spread widely across. Uh, and so it tells us maybe that this is something that in fact people in general seem to like. Okay. Uh, as I said, I'll mention that they, they have given us copyright permission to put that up on the screens here, use it in our class, uh, use this on YouTube, things of that sort. Okay, let's take a look at the game chart. This is the game chart for Berry Patch Scramble. Okay, uh, substantially larger. The largest number here is 70. There are 70 different states in this game. Um, and uh, which is uh, fairly substantial, about as big as we're going to be able to fit on a single sheet of paper. Here we're only showing the wins for white. So this is a win for white because we have all white edges coming in and no black edges going out. So if we can get to this position, black has no moves. There's a symmetric one down here, fifth, state 51, in which black goes in here and, uh, and no white edges come out. So we're only showing here the white edge, the white winning states but they always correspond to an equivalent. This white state corresponds to that black winning state. This white winning state corresponds to the, that black winning state. Uh, when we get the game board just a little bit more simplified, we'll show both of those uh, winning states. Okay? Notice this line here, too. Um, so if I'm on this side of this, here's the starting position. And if I'm on the right of this line, there are no winning states over here. And I can wander around here forever. Uh, there is never any reason to cross over that line. For example, black could cross over the line, but has an alternative to stay in the safe zone. White could cross over this line, but has an alternative to stay here, and then black would go back. Um, so every one of these things has an alternate move. Black could go across the line, but could stay down here as, instead. And with good play, anytime you cross over the line, you will lose the game. So if black crosses over here, white will win the game immediately. If white goes across here, black will, lin, will win the game immediately here. Seven is a win for black, uh, etc. Now some of these will take a little bit longer and we'll sort of show a little bit more some of these other positions in a bit. Uh, but the idea is that anytime you cross over the line with good play on your opponent's part, they will beat you. But you never have to cross over. Every one of those lines you crosses over has an alternative. Okay? So that proves that winning, there is no forced win, because we can always manage to stay on the side if we want. No one player can force a win from the other player. Okay? And as long as we stay on the right with good play, this is a draw for, for both players. Okay? Now, without going into some of the details that we did on, the, uh, uh, on where the, which edges got removed the way that we did with Pong Hao Ki, I'm just reducing here to the one ply look ahead chart. Uh, notice, by the way, there's a whole bunch of, there's some winning positions here for white, and winning positions here for black, that are very, very difficult to get to because uh, people will instead get to some of these other positions. So, for example, if I'm here and I'm, uh, I, I would not, not have gotten here as white because I wouldn't have made this move because I would have come down here and won. And I wouldn't get to this position as black because if I was here and wanted to get to here, I would instead have gone there, which is a win for black. So a lot of this stuff kind of goes away on us when we go to that one ply look ahead. Now, when I've done this, uh, there's a couple of interesting um, things that have happened. And I've deleted those moves that the one ply look ahead would forbid. Uh, and there are some positions here, For look at this line here, the way that I've drawn it. So 19, if it's, we're in position 19 and it's the black's turn to go, they have no choice except to go over here. And I hope you can see it's aimed at this spot, 64. But I don't have the edge drawn coming back because if I was in position 64 and it was black's turn to go, I wouldn't do that. I would come straight down here and win because I have one ply look ahead. I wouldn't make that move instead. So going from 19 to 64 is okay, 64 to 19 isn't, so we er erase one end of it because we're never going to go from 64 um, over to here. But the thing then that happens that's kind of interesting is that now there's a whole bunch of stuff, all, all of the part of the graph that contains a state 19 is completely disconnected. This part doesn't connect through here, this doesn't connect here, this doesn't connect here. If I was in 62, I would never go there, I would come down here and win the game. If I was in 63, I would not go over here and get into those things. Instead, I would go up here and win the game. So all of these edges here will never be played if we have one ply look ahead. 
And so a lot of that stuff just disappears. Okay? Uh, in a similar sense, state 62 is also unreachable because we can't, you know, while this is going to go away, so we don't have this edge coming in, and so the only way to get to 62 would be to go in from one of those winning states, but of course as soon as the game is won, it stops. So this state is going to go away also. And so what that means now is uh, after we delete those particular states, we now have a much simpler board. Okay? Um, and there's a few more things now that we might recognize as being unreachable. For example, six state 64 here, you can only get to now by having gone, continued the game from a winning position. Same thing with 68. So those states are now going to go away. Uh, we can never be in state 63. Where is state 63? Lost it, right here. We can never be in state 63 and have it be white's turn to move. Okay? In order for it to be white's turn to move, black would have had to have gone here. And so black would have to have gone from state the winning state over to here, but he's obviously not going to do that. So state 63 is never going to be have white uh, making a move from there. So we're never going to go out in any of those directions from, from 63. We might go from 43 to 63 and then have black win, but we would never go from 63 to 43 because we can never be there when it is white's turn. Okay? And in a similar sense, then once we've deleted the 63, the, the edge going from 63 to 10, there's no way to get to 10, then there's no way to get to 30, and there's no way to do then that particular way of getting to the winning state of 50. So we get a few more things on this one ply chart that we can get rid of, okay? Um, and uh, uh, this is just, right, this is on the other side. So 56 to 60, oh wait, no, it, it, it's, here it is, 56 to 63. The only way we can get here from 56 to 63 uh, would be for white to move, but that can't happen. There's no way for black to come in here. We, the only way to get to this position, you know, if, if it's Black's turn, Black's going out here, but we're never going to have Black play in here. So again, White is never going to go that way or that way. So those edges can also never be used, okay? The whole edge, 56 to 63. We can never be here when it is White's turn. We can never be here when it is White's turn. So that edge is irrelevant to us. And so by using that kind of analysis, we simplify the game chart even more. Okay? And so here's kind of a reduced, after we've done all of this work with uh, trying to figure out what moves might be forbidden in a one-ply look ahead, there we go. And we have deleted at this stage 28% of uh, the states in the chart that we started with. And this is just a lot easier now to analyze what's going on and to see the effects of crossing this center line. So now we see, for example, that uh, if I cross the center line, I'm going to go to black and then to white, and white's going to win. If I cross here, it'll be white goes there and then black goes there and win. White goes here, black wins. This will be a little bit more complicated because that's going to be black goes across, then white, then black, um, or black, then white, then black, then white. Okay. But again, but these ones up here and the equivalent ones down here are all going to be Ill, impossible once we get to two-ply look ahead. Black would see one, two, and instead would circle around here waiting for white to go back. So we can see the effects of that line pretty easily when we reduce this to a one-ply look ahead. So we'll avoid an awful lot of those crossings, and here is the game chart now uh, with two-ply look ahead, and things have, have simplified dramatically. So uh, if you want, a, a, an interesting exercise here is to play the game of Huang Hao Ki. These two positions now are the only sort of uh, uh, traps available. What we would like to have at this stage is um, uh, to try and use those two positions, uh, but we need to know what they are. And I haven't actually told you what those, what those numbers stand for, but you should be able to sort of, by playing it, uncover those. Okay? Here is our two-ply look-ahead chart, assuming that both of them, both players have two-ply look-ahead. The analysis for this is now easy. There's no way to force a win because uh, black never has to make that move to cross over. We only have to go down here. 
White never has to make this move to cross over, we only go up here, and of course there are no winning positions on the right hand side. Okay. <clears throat> How far ahead though do we have to look to be able to recognize this? Well this is a, a four chain, this is a four ply. Uh, white makes a move, black makes a move, white makes a move, black makes a move. This is a four ply chain look ahead which makes this game noticeably more challenging than something like Pong Hao Ki. To be able to not lose this game, we have to actually be able to see four ply look ahead, or you know, memorize that one position. Memorizing one position and having two ply look ahead would do the same thing. And then of course, our traps, if we want to be a good player, we have to know what those positions 23 and 38 are. So if I am black, I would like to get to position 38 as often as possible because maybe white will make the safe move over here, but maybe white will make the mistake. And if they're not a particularly good player or have that position memorized, then at least if I can get here often enough, at least once, they're going to end up making that mistake. Similarly, if I'm, if I am, um, if I'm white, uh, I would like to get to this position. Okay, Sorry, if I'm white, if I'm white, I want to get to position 23, so we go this direction, and eventually I win. And if I'm black, I'd like to get to position 38, so that we go off in this direction, and black gets to win. Okay? Okay. So we can see some of those things fairly easily when we get into these uh, uh, reduced game charts. Let's go on to the eight-sided one. Uh, as I say, I leave that exercise for you to figure out what those two trap positions are. But let's look at the octagon. So the traditional board here for uh, Mutorer is played with an eight-sided star, uh, the version that I have from the, uh, the museum in Christchurch, New Zealand. Instead of having star points, this is an octopus, and these are the eight legs coming out of the octopus. But this is the traditional form of the game. To make it more directly comparable, to the games we've been playing, I'm going to put this on an octagon with these lines crossing. The rule here for Mutorer is you can always move from the Putahi out to one of the points, from a point into the Putahi, or from a point around the outside to one of the other points next to it, which of course is exactly the same as this. Okay? But I'd like to emphasize that the fact that the actual board and rules are stated quite differently than this is, uh, is an indication that this is an independent invention. This board here, we might imagine it came by taking the Chinese or the Thai board and making it more elaborate, moving from a, four, from a square to, a, to an octagon instead. But in addition to being a dramatically you know, bigger game by uh, changing the underlying shape, they have changed the way that the game is played. Logically, it's the same as this. But the actual physical play of the game now is really quite different. So this gives us a pretty strong indication, even though New Zealand is not all that terribly far uh, from Thailand. Nevertheless, there wasn't really very much uh, a trade between Southeast Asia and uh, uh, New Zealand and Australia, which is why we have all those funny animals in Australia that we don't find anywhere else in the world, because of that isolation. But uh, but in addition, although there, as I say, there was some trade in those areas, but this game is just physically so different that it does seem almost surely to have been an independent invention by the Maori, which again ends up having more or less the same rules as the ones from uh, the other maximal board games. Okay, so eight pointed pointy stars move around the outsides to and from the Putahi, um, or equivalent to playing this octagon with all of the edges. There's no edges missing. It, you can't quite see the bottom one right here, I think. But it is intended to be there. Okay? There, there is one extra rule, though, that's added to here. Because if this is my initial layout, then I could actually black, if it's black's turn to play, black could win the game by moving this piece into the center. And white would now be completely trapped. That would leave this space open, but white doesn't have, that's the only, would be the only open space then. But white would have no way to get to it, to no legal move to take from any one of these pieces and move it all the way up here. So this move right here would win on the first move, and that's kind of a silly game uh, when 
the person who makes the right first move just automatically wins. So there's this extra rule here that you're not allowed to move from the outside to the putahi unless you are initially adjacent to an enemy piece. So this piece can move into the center because it's an adjacent to an enemy. This piece can move into the center because it's adjacent to an enemy. And of course, because there's a symmetry in the board, a vertical symmetry here, those two moves are the same. Moving that piece in is symmetrically the same as moving that piece in. So for that very first move, there really is only one option as to what we can do. Okay. As I say, this prevents an immediate win and also prevents various other kinds of easy wins. Um, <clears throat> there are some sources that say that this extra rule expires uh, after, say, the first two moves. But uh, the game board, the instructions that I have from the museum in Christchurch, New Zealand, the National Museum there, uh, does not say that. It says that rule goes on forever. So there's some slight variations in terms of the details of this. Um, if you add in that extra rule, it does change the, the game charts, uh, makes it actually easier than to win. Uh, games can move easier. Uh, so it can be analyzed both ways, and it certainly has been analyzed both ways. But for now, I'm going to assume that rule stays in place all the way through. It just makes the game chart a little bit easier. Now, um, the positions, though, that we have here are a little bit harder to sort of think our way through because when we were doing the uh, Pong Hao Ki or the Berry Patch Scramble, there was one symmetry, there was one vertical symmetry, and so we, we would view this and this as being symmetrically equivalent, and so when we made the game chart uh, from any position we were in, the position we had might be on the game chart exactly as it is, but we might have to flip it first before we could find its location on the game chart. Well, because this has so much symmetry, this has eightfold rotation, along with a bunch of reflections. So eight rotations plus eight reflections, all together there are 16 different positions, some of which turn out to be the same, but still in many cases you'll have 16 different positions of the board that are all really just the same game position. Uh, much like when we were doing tic-tac-toe, have putting your first X in any one of the four corners was the same. All four of those positions were equivalent. And here we can have as many as 16 different positions being equivalent. So when we start to try and map these out on the game chart, it, it, we get a, a certain amount of challenge in terms of what our names for those positions are. So this, what we do is, you know, there are 46 different positions here that we can have. And when we're trying to map these to a position on the game or vice versa, our rule for how we do this um, is that uh, uh, we always list the centerpiece first. So all of these positions have the open, um, all of these positions have the open uh, spot being in the dead center. Here, all of these positions now have the A in the dead center, a lot more of them. And then all of the rest of these have the B in the very center. Okay, so of all the way, and then of all the ways that we could list the outside eight, uh, we all either clockwise or counterclockwise, and starting from any one of the eight points, any one of the eight sort of rotation points, we try and find the one that comes alphabetically first. So from this here, we went A A, we went started off with two A's, then a B, then two A's, and then three B's. Uh, this would be equivalent to having an A O in the center, three B's in a row, a couple of A's, and then a B, and a couple of A's, but that would alphabetically come later. Uh, so we try and find the one that's always alphabetically first, although there's a, this little oddity uh, that makes life, that actually makes life easier, that we think of O as alphabetically coming before the A, the open spot, the blank, because this is really a blank space. So we think of the blank space as coming before the A's. And what that means then is that when we are uh, trying to work out something, uh, if we have something other than the O in the center, then we always put the center, then we go to the O on the outside, 
And then we either go clockwise or counterclockwise from that O, depending on which one would have the most A's at the beginning. So here we went to an O on the outside, and then we went in some direction where there were some A's right in a row, two A's right in a row. If we had gone in the other direction, we would have hit this B first. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if what we have is the O in the center, then we don't have any easy, obvious markers to where to start on the outside. So we end up starting with uh, the longest sequence of A's that we can find, because that's going to be alphabetically first. So here we had the O in the center, and then we had four A's in a row. So of course, putting it in that order um, will, will be alphabetically first. If there are three A's, then we would do them first. Two A's, that sort of thing. So uh, trying to figure out from a position on the board which one of these things it corresponds to can take a little bit of effort. We have to sort of try a variety of things and understand something about the way in which these symbols have been constructed uh, by this idea of center position first, then try and arrange the outside, figure out the way that's alphabetically first from the outside. So as it turns out, it's fairly easy if I take one of these positions to sort of set up the game from that number. So if I have number 29, I put B in the center, and then I put O in one of the points on the outside, and then I just go around from it. I go B, A, B, A, 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 B. I just put them in that order, and that's going to work out. That will correspond to this particular position uh, in the game. On the other hand, if we're sort of imagining playing a game and going through the actual game chart for Mu Torre, it is sometimes hard to follow that because we'll have something that goes from position 28 to position 4, or from 4 to position 28, and we can't figure out how to actually do that on the game board because we have to sort of rethink our way through what rotation and what reflection will get us to that from sort of the, the moves that we have. So that becomes a little bit uh, uh, more challenging, but it is certainly the kind of thing that if we're playing with this, we'd like to be able to do that. Go back and forth from the game chart to the game board. Here they are, they are dramatically different kinds of things, and we have to be able to get from a state number to a position that we're playing on the board, and from that position on the board back to the plate to the position number. But assuming that we can do that, let's take a look at what the, the Mutor Rare game chart looks like. So, here is the, the full Mutorer game chart, okay? And I would like to point out uh, where is our largest number here. So here is the number 46. Uh, on the uh, Berry Berry Patch Scramble, there were 70 different positions. We have gone to a larger game here, more points, more places to put the pieces, and yet, instead of having 70 positions, or much more than that, which we would expect, we instead have only 46 positions. Um, and the reason for this is all that symmetry, so that one of these, this position right here, might correspond to as many as 16 different physical positions that we could have. Whereas in Berry Patch Scramble, if we had a, a position on the game chart, it might correspond to this position, it might correspond to this position, but it only corresponded to two. Whereas in Muto Rare, this could correspond to any one of different eight or different rotations, plus some reflections and rotations of them. So each one of these positions sort of encapsulates a whole lot more options than before, and hence, as I say, the, the uh, uh, game chart is actually simpler than the one that we have for Barry Patch and Scramble. This line corresponds to a very, very similar kind of a thing, but not quite because the starting position is on the same side of the line as all of the wins. So here are the various winning positions. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they're all on the same side as the start. On the other hand, if we get over to this side, this is the draw side. There are no winning positions over here, and there is never any force to come back. So if I'm in 38, I could play A and come over to the, uh, to the side where all the wins are but I could stay over on the draw side by moving up here. And that's true with everyone. I don't have to cross the line, I could go here instead. B doesn't have to cross the line, they can go this way instead. And with good play, in fact, um, going across, coming back across that line will always result in the other player winning, if they're good enough anyways. Okay? Um, now, 
I'm going to go straight to the two-ply chart, and I'm not going to spend the time we did before with uh, understanding why it simplifies the way that it does. There's very little change with the one-ply uh, look ahead. I'm going straight to the two-ply look ahead. I have a slightly different start position here, and I need to justify that, I suspect. So let's go back here. The starting position here was position one. A has no choice except to go to here. B has no choice except to go to here. So I'm going to start from here, and all of this stuff is going to turn out to be impossible to get to. Because with two-ply look ahead, B would, if in this position it was B's turn, B would never go here because A could win. B would instead choose to go up here. Similarly, if we were in position 28 with A to play, A would never go there and allow B to win. A would instead come this way. So everything here we might as well throw away, but to do that I need to instead see that after two moves we would go A and then B, and this might, be, might as well be thought of as our start position. Okay. Okay. So um, with uh, two-ply look ahead, let's see what happens here. Um, there's only one winning move now. B only has one place to win. A has only one place to win. I hope you notice there's a whole lot of these lines that sort of go one direction but not the other direction. So for example, A would not make this move going here because A does, in the actual board, uh, in the actual game chart, A does have the option of going from here to here. I've removed that move because a is never going to get a chance to play that because if B is a good player, B will not go up to here. So we're never going to get to that position with A to play. A might make this move to go here, but then it won't be A's turn, so we won't be able to make that move. B should never make that move with two-ply look ahead because A will win. Okay? So we're never really going to be able to get there with A to play. On the other hand, we might get there if we were in position two. We might go A here and then B here and get over to the draw side, the draw territory of this game chart. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and there's a few other things here that, that are, uh, that are uh, easy to not understand. Uh, 12, for example, will never play to 21. B in position 12 will not go to 21. Why not? Because there used to be an A win up here, which has been omitted because with two-ply look ahead, B would never make that move and allow A to win. Uh, and there's no other way for um, us to get here with A uh, being the player. So that, the winning position that was up here a moment ago is no longer there at all. Okay. So this simplifying assumes that both players are really uh, uh, two-ply look-ahead uh, players. Okay. So some of those positions have just sort of uh, gone away. And um, Position number 31, uh, again, A never has to go over, but with two-ply look-ahead, might, because it takes three-ply look-ahead at this position to realize that how bad a move that is. With three-ply look-ahead, I will, might see that if A goes here, B could go here, that's move, uh, sorry, this would be four-ply. One move here, B goes here, A is forced to go here, B wins. And that's looking four ply ahead. So this is, uh, all of these other crossovers will be eliminated by two ply look ahead, but not these two. A might go over here, B might go over there. Uh, with good play, they will lose, but that's not immediately obvious. It's going to require a good uh, um, opponent. Uh, interestingly enough, position number two needs six ply look ahead, or good memorization to make sure that you don't make the wrong move. So from position two, let's imagine I'm A. Well, I could go here, and as we see, B will go here, and then we'll be over in draw territory. I could go down here, B will be forced to go here, A now has a couple of different options. We could end up coming around back to two, we could end up going over here, uh, but nothing bad happens. On the other hand, imagine that A goes this way, okay, back to the starting position. Remember, the starting position was where we started when it was A's turn to go. But now we've gotten to this position with B's turn to go. So if A makes the wrong move and goes here, B will go up, A will be forced to go to here, a good player B will play over here, A is forced to come down, and B will now win. And how far ahead do we have to see? A has to see one, two, three, four, five, six ply ahead to be able to realize the danger of that just by look ahead. 
I, I think that would be a good, a good spot to just memorize what you're supposed to do. Okay? Because uh, otherwise it requires six ply look ahead to see what's going to happen in that particular position. Which is why generally if you play this game long enough, somebody is going to get to this position and make the wrong move. Okay? Um, we get to this position, if B makes the wrong move, uh, if it's B's turn and B makes the wrong move, then A is forced to go here, B is forced to go here, A isn't forced, but with good play they'll go here, if they have three ply look ahead now, they'll go here, B will then be forced to go here, and A will win. <clears throat> okay? So, uh, this game, unlike the other ones, tends not to go on forever, because somebody will eventually make that mistake. Okay, a few wrap-up points on uh, these games here. So, uh, um, Asher has some game charts with four-point versions of, four-point and six-point versions of Muto Rare. I mentioned that before. Their game, her game charts are much simpler than these, because there is so much additional symmetry involved. Those boards have lots of symmetry and consequently much fewer positions available. The, but the four-point Mutorer has no winning positions and the six-point Mutorer is a draw with only two-ply look-ahead. Remember, the berry, berry, the berry patch scramble required four-ply look-ahead to, to, uh, uh, to be a draw. Um, this one does it, uh, is a draw with two-ply look-ahead Consequently, we can only think of that as a children's game. Uh, it would not be appropriate for, for older folks. Okay? And she says these, this simplified version of Mutorer would not at all be an interesting game. But if we delete that one edge, then it turns out that it is. And she was unaware of, those, of that other sort of class of games. Now, I just want to mention some stuff we're going to be getting to a little bit uh, in our next lecture. Uh, so we'll get, but we'll men I'll mention these here. There are a a class of games referred to as uh, three in a row games. Uh, these are things like tic-tac-toe, where if you get three X's in a row, the X wins, three O's in a row, O wins. <clears throat> um, this, uh, um, these tend to be better than the tic-tac-toe games, which are again children's games. Okay? This one is, is called Six Man's Morris. Six men because we have six white pieces and there are six black pieces. And we see we have this uh, square on the inside and a square on the outside and then various connections here. And we move along those edges exactly as before. But what we're trying to do is to get three in a row. Uh, and more or less, once you get three in a row along one edge, like here, here, and here, you've, you've won. That's, I'm simplifying the rules a little bit there. Uh, but more or less, you've probably won the game at that stage. Okay. Uh, these games are very popular in, uh, in England especially, but, but they were certainly played in other parts of Europe. <clears throat> the oldest version we know comes from 1400 BCE in an Egyptian temple. So this is carved on the roof, presumably by the people who were doing the construction of the temple, uh, this particular game board. And so uh, we, we believe this game to be really very, very old. Okay. Another sort of three in a row game, and one we're going to spend a little bit more time on, is called Achi. This comes from Ghana in Western Africa. And we're basically playing it on a tic-tac-toe board, but it's trying to mix some of these blockade strategies with these three in a row strategies, which is why I wanted to talk about it today to go along with the blockade games that I was referring to. So here's the idea. We have this basic sort of tic-tac-toe board where you can do three in a row on uh, uh, rows, columns, or diagonals. But we're going to do something different with it. So there are nine spots here. Each player will begin with four pieces, and they place them one at a time. That's sort of the stage one. And that ends up acting like tic-tac-toe, where you're trying to get three in a row, except that three in a row on the diagonals does not count. So it's much more likely that that first part will be sort of a draw than it would be in uh, tic-tac-toe uh, among, uh, uh, among beginners, at least. Okay? So those don't win. These diagonal lines are in there only for stage two of the game. So in stage two of the game, we now proceed to move the pieces along the edge exactly like Pong Hao Ki. Now this will then turn into essentially a maximal blockade game. Each player has four pieces. That's eight pieces. There are nine spots. So there's one, always one spot <clears throat> that's open, and that makes it a maximal blockade game. But you can win either by blocking your opponent as in a blockade game, or by getting three in a row. So you sort of have lots of different threats. You might be threatening to get three in a row. You might be threatening to block your partner. Either way, um, 
we would then uh, be able to win the game. Okay? So this combines features of uh, the three in a row games that come primarily from Europe and these blockade games which seem to come primarily from Asia and yet we're seeing these, these, this in Egypt at a very ancient point uh, in game history which of course just raises lots of questions in terms of where these things came from which ones might have been descended from which other ones how much was independent invention how much might have been diffusion of games uh, we just really don't know now this particular game really has thousands of possible positions. So I'm not going to show you a game chart for Achi. A game chart for Achi is essentially impossible for people to do. The board is just much too big. Uh, it has, in, in uh, somewhat recent years, uh, computers have constructed the entire game chart so that computers can analyze what's going on uh, with Achi. Uh, but they, of course, can, can store a lot more stuff in memory than people can, even with the use of paper. Okay. Uh, when we get to analyzing these three in a row games, as I say, in general, these full game charts are much too big. We did a little bit of analysis of a portion of the game tree for tic-tac-toe in one particular position. And even that got us a, a, a fairly extensive thing. Trying to do the entire game chart for tic-tac-toe uh, would be fairly big. And these other ones, because of all the many, many other options, are really much bigger. Um, on the other hand, we can do look ahead trees from specific positions. So we might take a particular position and then look at the two ply look ahead tree from that spot. Not the entire game chart from that spot, but, the, but uh, a two ply look ahead. And if we could do that on a regular basis as we were playing through the game, especially if we could build that chart in our head, then we would have two ply look ahead for the game as a whole. Okay? And in our next lecture, we're going to do a little bit of that, and we're going to see some examples of doing that with Achi. Uh, but we're also going to, to then apply the same approach to analyzing the game of Mancala. So Mancala is much like the uh, Chukaruma games that we did earlier, but we have lots of, of these pieces that can move around and lots and lots of possible combinations. And again, a full game chart would be much, much too big to, to deal with. But we can, in many situations, do the same idea of a one-ply or two-ply or three-ply look-ahead tree uh, for some particular position we might find ourselves in in Mancala. And we'll take a look at doing that in our next lecture.